are recording. <laughs> we are recording. We're <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yourself um, in regards to your career at Playhouse. So you joined in 2004, is that right? Yeah. So I've been at the Playhouse for 15 years or so. Um, yeah, that's a long time. But I've stayed largely because the practice has kept evolving and there's still a lot to kind of explore and particularly around the relationship between audience and performer and how you uh, different strategies and different methodologies of encouraging audience in inverted commas to participate um, and become co- co-actors or um, yeah, or co-explorers in the learning experience of a piece of theatre. That sounds all very sort of high doesn't it? Um, and I think that's largely been informed by the sort of growth in early years education, where creative play is stimulated. Uh, you know, a variety of um, of resources are provided, and children, small children, play with them. And, and the facilitator in that circumstance follows the ch- child's lead and, and joins with their game and perhaps intervenes in the game and makes suggestions or infers or, or ideas or questions that, that influence the game and the game develops. And, we've, and that's sort of passed up through the primary key stages as, as sort of explorations in that early years work. So we've tried to incorporate that attitude in our in our work for older key stages up to kind of year six. So we're trying to maintain a playful nature within the structure of the story and the theatrical piece that really allows the children to participate meaningfully and have some sort of exploration of the questions and themes that we're swimming around. It would be disingenuous to suggest that it is a completely free play because we are there as adults and we are guiding the learning or directing the the learning and questioning into particular areas to explore particular things. But largely we are collecting thoughts and opinions and suggestions and we do try to maintain that there's no right answer so so would you say that the the level of engagement of the participants that you work with has changed any from when you first started working as a teacher actor to now yeah i would i would definitely say so uh, uh, a lot of a lot of the early programs that i was involved in when i worked with the playhouse before i was a core member as a freelancer um were perhaps here is here is a scene and we're going to use a particular drama strategy to explore the content of that scene but from outside the drama almost as as viewers it's you know it's not a it's still used as a form and i think it still has mileage but what we've tried to maintain is a cohesive world of the fiction that the children have a role in that so they they might be implicated observers. They might be witnesses to something happening. They might become friends of a of a person with a problem or in a difficult situation, and they're they're asked for advice and help, or or anything they do practically is to inform or guide or explain. So it, it's rooted in the demands of the story and the theatre. Certainly as a participant within your work um, and as a voyeur watching the different um, pieces that you share with the schools and and share with the pupils that you're working with, what stands out to me as one of your largest strengths within the TIE practice is the Playhouse's ability to storytell. And I was wondering how, how have you sharpened that to perform it so fluently and get it right almost nine out of ten times with the way in which you deliver your stories because the storytelling within your practice is outstanding and as you were saying that is what allows these young people to not only engage with what you're performing for them but then also feel safe enough to participate within it i think 
it's I think it's probably well documented that you know people are storytelling animals ever since you know the dawn of time people have told stories uh, mythological stories uh, apocryphal stories uh, allegorical stories moral tales of Esau or whatever and and they are told at the Bible stories uh, I don't know a lot about Islam but I will say there are similar stories in the Quran about uh, models of behavior and thoughts and ideas and problems which are explored through story which gives you an analytical objective distance but also you can be emotionally engaged in the dilemma of that particular person's problem or difficulty or that group of characters and we build that emotional engagement in the in the story and that allows people to forget any sort of inhibitions i would say or, or limit their inhibitions and they they're not talking about themselves they're talking about somebody on the stage who is a you know a part filled vessel if i can inappropriately borrow that dorothy paradigm um and and they fill that person with their own life experience their own thoughts their ideas the rhetoric that they've heard heard around their kitchen table their view of the world to to bring what they know of the world to bear on it and in that they hear from their peers all the different takes other experiences but we're in the world of this story so at the end i never finish with a happily live happily ever after but there's always a, there's always a yes but at the end of it and a rhetorical question to carry on thinking about but i think it's just it's just something that um human animals do they communicate through story and metaphor and i think so we we sort of developed over time a number of strategies so this a program that we do is based on little red riding Hood, made with john from neelands originally a very long time ago and essentially it's it's a dramatic deconstruction of the story of little red riding hood where children take on the role collectively of little red at one point they go on a journey through the woods they meet the wolf uh, they have conversations with her mother they meet the countess who's heard of this close encounter in the woods and they make a choice they make a choice about whether they're going to live with the countess and have a nice china doll or stay in the cottage in the woods with a raggy old saggy soggy rabbit that her dad made uh who's no longer on the scene but um so that's it's, that's a sort of episodic with which very clear structures the hansel and gretel which was made a few years after that i've just been touring it the children arrive to hear a story from the great tattershall and it begins the story and involves them in asks them for help to picture the inside of the cottage that Hansel and Gretel live in to do the sound effects of the of the journey through the woods imagine and build and construct the gingerbread house what sweets is it actually made of and then problem solve their escape from the um, from the cottage pulling together li little elements from earlier on and problem solving and um, coming up with a plan to escape that we enact together and and ultimately def defeating belladonna our our sort of witch figure um and 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 then they're left with the task of well they're still in the woods they still don't know the way back home what what next for hansel and gretel um how do they solve that problem and that's left with them as a a writing task in the broadest sense so then they're not required to write it down by us a teacher may ask them to but initially they're asked to tell, decide what the story is and tell it to someone else so it's a spoken word and the and i guess the spoken word is constantly changeable it's spontaneous it evolves in response to the audience now i suppose that's that's a great development in, in actually trying to be responsive to the audience in storytelling as opposed to story reading every time a story gets told it changes slightly 
And and I, I, I smiled when you said about getting it right so many times because the only way you can get it right is if you respond to a child and you can you can talk yourself into a blind alley and you have to dig yourself out of it. Um, and that's what makes it playful as well. It's called a play when people act. It's called a play and it's supposed to be playful. Um, and you can you can enjoy those difficulties and those challenges. So when it comes to your rehearsal methodology then, how how do you go about putting together a program of work what comes first is it that you have the narrative or an idea or a story which you think would make a fantastic adaptation or a great story to tell or is it through consultation with schools and curriculum research where you think actually the PSHE why don't we have a go at trying to develop some work engagement work for the PSHE curriculum how do you go about in rehearsal putting together this this program or this performance okay well there isn't there isn't one single model uh, there are lots so there's a commissioning model for instance with our, pe- our work around preventing violent extremism was obviously a concern to a great many people about the rise of violent extremism and we were asked with other theater companies to put together a, a, a model of how how would we approach it and we uh, we gained that uh, franchise or, or whatever that commission and we we then went into making the model so we talked about we but essentially we talked about the problems the questions that were the, the rise in violent extremism was inviting of people um perhaps the universal the universal overarching question of how do we how do we manage to live together in the same place when we all believe different things how do we accommodate our differences and our similarities and and we found or created a story that responded to real events that were happening and theatrical situations so we we put our protagonists together in a, a derelict shop so they were that's the pressure cooker where they they can't escape from with events going on outside that they can't get out because of the the riot that's going on um and in the, I mean, that's a well-tried uh, theatre form, isn't it? Like Agatha Christie puts all her protagonists in a country house cut off from the rest of the world. And we see that trope time and time again. Um, and then we think about the different aspects. What, do, what points of view are the people going to represent? What aspects of the conversation are they going to repre- represent? And who holds that together? Who holds the middle ground and supports the children in interrogating and engaging with those people. And also those people have to be fallible. There have to be weaknesses in their position and the potential for change. So those central characters. So that so Tapestry was a commission and, and careless talk. Uh, around, there was a, a, obviously a great concern around knife crime and the rise of knife, knife crime. And we had conversations with various people about that and it, and made that in a similar way so we started from what felt like a the need for a conversation about something and how can we have that conversation and what are the things we should actually be talking about in that conversation but then also uh on one occasion i remember a staff meeting where we're sitting around going actually we haven't got many science and number programs why why is that why don't we do something around number and then we thought about what stories might be appropriate. And we came up with a piece based on Little Red Hen for nursery and reception children, which looks at the principles of number and positional language and simple counting in, in various different ways, but doesn't require them to get the right answer. So it's not, it's not about them solving sums, doing sums to sort it out, but applying the, the maths knowledge that they have already in the world of a story and it, of course red hence about growing things and processes and transforming growing wheat into bread um and the animals on a farmyard um yeah um so, and sometimes sometimes we find a story that we'd really like to explore and think there's a lot of potential in a, a, an example i can think of is a story called uh, night john 
which we used as the basis of program about African-American slavery and the slave trade in America, where a slave, a slave arrives on a plantation and does a deal with a girl, a 14 year old girl on a plantation. She has access to tobacco. So he does a deal with her. He will teach her to read if she gives him tobacco. So, um, um, and of course, she, it becomes discovered that she can learn how to read and the slave owner then punishes, wants to punish her, but he steps up and takes the punishment and he sets up a secret school. So it looks about, it talks about the value of, um, of education as a tool for liberation, really, and why, why the slave owner might not want the slaves to be able to read. Um, and that came from a, sh a short novel uh, that we were introduced to by Jonathan Neelands. So there, there are all sorts of approaches. Sometimes you read a story and go, this would be, this would be fantastic. There's so many questions in this to chew over. It would be, it'd be really exciting to do that with a group of young people. Sometimes we think about a story that we like, like the story of the selfish giant, the Oscar Wilde story. Um, and think about where where could we go with this? What what can we do with this artistically? So we use a lot of shadow play in that one and we explore shadow play and sharing and private property and common access and stuff like that. So you're having a difficult difficult conversation with children about sharing in the world of the story. Because doesn't the giant doesn't have the giant have the right to have his own garden private and not have people playing it? And stuff like that. So, <laughs> big questions. So, once you've made once you've made the work, then what's the next step before it obviously goes on to a tour? Will you invite teachers to see it? Do you just take it out? And have you ever taken any work into schools and it hasn't worked, and you've had to take it back to the drawing board? Um, well, I think that I think the last of those. Uh, that that's always an ongoing process. There's a constant process of reflection and reworking and, and refeeding in. And some pieces, some pieces have needed significant rethinking uh, and have gone back into the the rehearsal room really to to make new scenes or to reorder the scenes or uh, to restructure it. So they have had significant. Um, work done on them uh, most stuff is modified on the road so in conversation with the team delivering or reflections with the artistic team uh, the director or whatever um, uh, and then then it is modified and may undergo restructuring on the road or or actually working with the children tells you the piece that you've got, not the piece you thought you had. So you, so by responding to what children are saying and saying interesting things, you go, actually, there's a lot of mileage in this. I'm going to go down that road. And perhaps the, the road that we thought was the main thread through is, is not what is engaging for children. So we're, we're going to sideline that and shift the focus onto this particular strand or theme. I suppose you're incredibly fortunate there, Malcolm. I suppose that you're incredibly fortunate there as an actor and as a facilitator to work within an area of theatre where you're constantly being afforded the opportunity to modify something or recreate something and reinvent a piece of work. And and I think that that, that must be really exciting, right? I, I think so, and that's why I've probably stayed doing it for so long. I, I do find it really exciting that um, every day is a new show. Although the structure is the same, that class that you're working with at that moment are going to say things probably in the similar general area to other children, but there might be that, that potential for it going off somewhere else. or it, And it might not be wildly different or wildly dramatic, but sometimes a child will have an insight and, you, and it, it makes you as a practitioner go, I never thought about it like that. And I, and I need to hold that in, it, in the performance so that that potential for it being said again or realised again or, or other people make those connections 
uh, yeah, to, and and have the space and the freedom to have their own take on it, not what I think, not what I think it is. I think that's one of the strengths of doing the same piece repeatedly for a block of time. You really get to know the material and the structure of it, so you can really concentrate on the needs of the group that you're with. And the way I describe that to teachers is it's like teaching the same lesson again and again, morning and afternoon for several weeks at a time. Whereas they might teach a lesson, have a reflection on it, and not come back to that lesson again for another academic year. So you can really build, really build the the, the learning, the experience through the duration of its tour, document that either through video or updating the script at the end of the tour. So it picks up from a similar place. It doesn't slip back too far before it goes out again. And every group of people that comes to a piece, when they pick up a script or the or see the video, they go, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. I'd have done it like this. And they, so they have their space to bring on it and make it a new thing and a, live again in a different kind of way yeah it's a really a really unique creative luxury and i don't off the top of my head i don't know if i can think of another artistic medium other than potentially maybe painting where an artist may work on a piece over a sustained amount of time and go back and retouch it and and keep creating any other artistic medium really and especially in theater where an actor may have the opportunity to keep going back to something and reinventing it and and that reinventing it within a dialogue of participants constantly your audience are constantly shaping as you've described and if they're not and if they're not they're not they're not truly participating it, 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 and i guess that's what we mean by meaningful participation that that actually what they say contributes in some way to that specific event at that specific moment and that specific time and place in a way that, uh, in a way that I know, you know, pantomime is participatory and I don't want to deride pantomime. I think this, I think it's great and I think there's a place for it, but the responses are predictable and are enjoyable, but often um often the the response from the stage when it is spontaneous is much more enjoyable than uh, the rehearsed and that and that that is really exciting we we've sort of begun to think about digitizing things and how how we might digitize and i guess the greatest challenge of that is how do we get that feedback from the audience and be responsive to it because if we pre-record it's fixed we can we can offer open questions but we can't get the responses back there's even even through something like zoom has its has its kind of limitations and you're in the hands of a facilitator on the ground but you know we're that's that's a continuing exploration about how we can how we can make that work and how we can um Keep keep doing, but keep the, the the energy and the spontaneity of the live event that is immediately responsive. Which is which is almost you could describe the soul of what of what you do is that the work is derivative of the participation and the young people that it comes into contact with as it moves along its journey. I guess yeah. I, I would say so. I'm, I'm just thinking now of of a day I had in school a couple of weeks ago doing Hansel and Gretel and a class in the morning that were great and were able to deduce and infer and bring so much more so as a as a practitioner I was able to respond to them and set them more and more difficult challenges uh, by asking questions and and we had a we, I certainly had never mind them we had a, a great time I enjoyed pushing it further and seeing where it could go, uh, seeing where it could go, where it would end up when I was following their lead. The afternoon class, same year group, but were at a different place. And it was still it was still very enjoyable, but they weren't as 
mature or as creative in their thinking as the as the morning group had been. Um, we still had a good time. They still made their their contributions. It was just different. It was just different, and we were able to follow their life experience to the limit of their uh, experience. And I was able to ask the questions with the caveat that if they weren't able to respond from that, I would backpedal, I would break the question down, or I would um, let it rest, or I would I would have an idea myself and find a way around it. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think that responsivity is at the, at the heart of it, and I, um, and I think it's what a good teacher does. When they when they are in a class, they've got the lesson plan, and we talk about this, but we don't really know what it means. So they they got the lesson plan, they know where they're going. But if they're really in tune with the children, and they're listening to the children's needs and interests, they become co-learners and explorers, and the status relationship shifts, and the children can teach the adult, and that's that's quite an exciting place to be. So your time is spent one half the rehearsal, the making process. Then the next large proportion of your time is spent on the road, touring the work. On the website, it says that you, um, you work with 15,000 pupils or students annually, which is a large, large number of young people to come into contact with. How, <laughs> of course, of course, how do you... I mean, there's there's a lot of questions to ask. How do you mentally, as a performer, a facilitator, go about delivering that work? Sometimes three, on the offshoot, maybe four times a day, if, you're, if you've really got to squeeze classes in. How do you go about working with that many young people and stopping the work from becoming stale or uninteresting to yourself more than to them, I guess? I think what the what the um, what the actor would say is when they walk out on the stage, they live it. They are possessed of that that moment. Whether you're in Hamlet or Samuel Beckett or or Alan Akebourne, whatever you put, you're possessed of that character. You you inhabit that moment as if we're using the Stanislavski term. It it was for the first time, and I think you do that. Depending, depending on the form and the style of the performance that you're in, you do that in a piece of theatre and education. And when you're genuinely asking children a question and listening to their responses, that's what keeps it alive, really. You can, you can ask the same starter question, but they can their response can bring you several different ways into the conversation and it's part of your brain it's got like a spider diagram in there connecting up all the possibilities and so when a child says one particular thing that that sort of bit illuminates that spider diagram um and you can see where you can lead off by different questions and how it can lead you into another area of exploration perhaps something the children hadn't thought of and you construct fresh and new those pathways round that spider diagram fresh every day in response to those in response to those children i guess um and that is the key to keeping it alive and uh, you know i i did tapestry for a very long time and i think i did get into a into habits cuz i know you find you find lines that work or you find jokes that you like to say or whatever for your own amusement or to get a response or to warm a, to warm an audience up or to quiet an audience down. And sometimes you just have to let those go because the needs of the group aren't, aren't ready for that yet. Or they, they're not giving you what you need to get there. You know, I, I, I can't get my favorite, line in because they haven't given me the lead into it and you just go well it's not going to happen today and you you, in, you enjoy it when it does or and I, yeah and I suppose in those moments you remember that every performance is a new performance 
and it's a new lived experience. Yeah, and you do need to you do need to remember that sometimes, particularly particularly if you've been doing one uh, program for a long time. And and if you come back to it a couple of years later, it's still new. The the circumstances have changed. The world outside has changed. So it's fair. So it's fair to say that a, a teacher actor. Would you still would you still refer to yourself as a teacher actor? Is that still um, an accurate job description of the work that you do? I I think so because there are there are skills of the teacher and the actor fused, and it's it's on some sort of seesaw. So if you sort of imagine a seesaw, and you're running up and down that seesaw, sometimes you're more at the teacher end of the seesaw, and sometimes you're more at the actor end of the te- seesaw. Um, uh, but you're constantly moving up and down. And on some days, at the same point in the programme that you did the day before, you might not be at the same point on the seesaw because the group is different. So your half your brain is going, what's the next line? Where, do, where did I put that prop? It's here somewhere. Oh, it's broken. Uh, it's doing that actory thing uh, uh, about being in the story and the technical requirements of that. But also your brain is going, okay, they've said this. I want them to think about that. How can I get them from there to here? What's the chain of questions? Or what's what's the next question that might point them to this area of, that we want to talk about so that they think they've come up on, on their own? It's, it's just the breadth of your skill base is incredibly vast and you're constantly switching hats all of the time. And I think to develop those skills, can that can only happen with time. What do you think some of the best training or ways for, let's say, new teacher actors or new actors or new educators who want to move into theatre and education, how do they develop those skills? Mm, I, well, I think... I think... I think you need to you need to have a passion for learning and it's and most of the time we work with children in schools but we do work in informal education settings we do do cpd for teachers so it's about it's about that commitment to learning in its broadest sense um to to do it to try it to practice it to practice it uh, in the context that's supportive and and get feedback on it. I, I remember a rehearsal process I was in once where we wrote on pieces of paper sort of personality traits or behaviours that might be presented from a, gro- a group of teenagers. They were put into a hat and then they were drawn out and each person played played that personality trait for an improvisation as someone facilitated a structured workshop and then it was it, it sort of <laughs> and then there was a conversation about how how to manage those behaviors or what strategies you could use to manage those behaviors if they're presented in school so so effectively each person had a go at leading the workshop several times with several different classes of children because the the random selection of personality traits um, yeah. Um, so I mean, but yeah. So it was it was rehearsing uh, a multiplicity of different options, and just having conversations after with your coworkers about your experience as a professional in that, and how do you think it went? Did they get to the point where we wanted them to get to? Why? Why did that not? that group not get there was it something we did or said earlier is there something we could do so you you're keeping those um conversations going those creative conversations and reflective conversations going with your team if you're out on the road with a group of people or your your creating team when they come and visit and um, see you see you at work in school do you think there's an optimum starting point Malcolm do you find that teacher actors that join the playhouse who come from a more traditional acting set of skill uh, bases develop 
as better teacher actors or do you feel that those people that come in from a more educational teacher background that then develop more as an actor throughout their duration with the company yeah. or, or do you think it's equal and dependent on the person i think each i think i think it is dependent on the person and i think it's dependent on their openness their ability and willingness to improvise um their um it, it, traditionally the sort of players when it started 30 odd years ago we're called teacher actors because most of the staff were recruited out of teaching and they were te they were teachers that were interested in drama as a learning medium um the first uh program was uh, featured a character called charlie the clown which was for very young children with additional languages than english to learn about color and shape so there's a lot, uh, I would say, people that have an interest and an ability in clowning. Not that they have to have a red nose on or anything like that, but it's there's something about the approach of the clown to see an opportunity and improvise or lampoon or question or challenge through their actions. Not, all, not necessarily for the purposes of humour but to to draw attention to some idiosyncrasy or silliness or nonsense and the, the the clown is an interesting point as a sort of naive person they can be taught by children but also the clown can be a wise fool and it's inter it's interesting how that description that you've just give there has almost shorthanded the practice of the the teacher actor in a way because that what you described earlier about how as a teacher actor you're constantly in a state of fluidity constantly remembering your narrative and the story and the development of this story that you're telling but you're also remaining fluid to the suggestions and the participation yeah. of your crowd yeah particularly particularly in early years work um um, but you you have the structure of the story, and sometimes you can you can rest on the story. It, it's not like trying to remember it in some ways. It's kind of it's kind of going right. Well, I know what the story of Hansel and Gretel is, so therefore the next bit that has happens has to be this. So it kind of flows naturally out of what's gone before. And I suppose that's the storyteller, isn't it? The storyteller improvising in the moment to embellish or come up with a resonant image or respond to something that's happened or somebody's done or, or tie back in something that was said earlier on to reintroduce that idea as a, uh, that someone has made earlier on, incorporate those suggestions. And people get a great sense of satisfaction out of that and affirmation that their idea has been reused and fed back in later so i mean that's a that's a storytelling strategy isn't it we we always smile when that happens we see that character in a film and we go they're going to become very important later on and suddenly they do and we go yes i knew it and we feel all very good about ourselves <laughs> so. in your experience malcolm how do schools best utilize theater and education uh that's very wide-ranging uh, sometimes schools will respond by following up an individual session. Uh, we try and leave something to do at the end of every programme so that teachers can start work on immediately um, and they, to produce something uh, on the back of the session. Um, some schools are more forward thinking and um, uh, and book something in at the start of a half term because they know they're going to work on it throughout the whole of the half term. Or they might book it in halfway through as a sort of reinvigorator or as, at the end as a sort of reflection back on what what they've been doing or earlier in the year. So some schools dig deep and connect to the story and work on the story and the, the content in a great deal of detail 
others maybe respond to a session and sometimes i get the distinct feeling that they'd rather be doing numeracy than be in a session with us and as soon as it's over they can't wait to get back to class and do the spelling test or whatever so it, it varies widely but uh, we have a group of schools that we go to regularly and they clearly value what we bring to schools otherwise they could wouldn't keep inviting us in and they every everything we do would would touch on literacy in some way shape or form uh, most of what we do connects to a specific curriculum area whether it be you know, a movement of the stars and the planets or life in ancient roman england or um whatever or it as a large sort of moral ethical dilemma that might connect to PSAG or SMSC or citizenship um, curricula whatever whichever acronym we're using this week um, yeah so but everything every we I guess that's why we try and explore big questions rather than deliver messages and that's that becomes interesting sometimes um, because we're commissioned by there's a, uh, a misconception I think between uh, schools and commissioners and us about what we do and what we can do and people think we are about delivering a message when actually we're trying to ask questions around something so the message if there is one in inverted commas comes um, becomes apparent uh, I suppose that's clearer in things like you know if we're if we're asked to do a, a some work around healthy lifestyles there is a baseline of received wisdom that what that people want to communicate um, and that, that becomes a little more challenging in some ways and the playhouse also offers cpd for schools and teachers as well is that correct yeah so um uh, yeah, so um, we can do uh, CPD sessions for teachers that might be day long, twilight, you know, short, short sessions, or um, we've done more sustained projects in conjunction with universities where they, supported by the Playhouse and university staff, teachers undertake a, a unit or part of an MA. Um, uh, and so and those projects have run typically over a year or so with sort of sporadic intervention where a, I know, perhaps typically in in the autumn term uh, a teacher will come on a training day paired with a teacher actor from Playhead who goes into school and works with them and delivers a session in their class and then in spring term those two people will work together and team teach uh, something um, uh, together. And in the third team, with uh, the third term as summer term, they will be supported by the Playhouse teacher actor and mentored uh, for that teacher to deliver something through drama to their class. So they're taken on a journey over the course of a year. Um, and we do lots of stuff around storytelling and literacy. Um, and just there's tons of, uh, of um, what's the word I'm looking for? There are tons of um, stories about how children have written expansively after a theatre experience where they've not been very expansive in their writing beforehand. Given an experience they can write about, even if it is a fictional experience, um, contributes to their ability to, to write. Uh, and achieve literacy outcomes and do you have do you have many schools that reach out to the playhouse in particular to explore certain topics is that is that something that ever takes place or is it always that they may get in contact and ask for something that explores a particular part of the curriculum or a certain story or text that they might be working on at the moment and then you will respond with well actually we're running this program at the moment um very occasionally someone rings up and says have you got anything on blah 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 
um, and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we work with that teacher to perhaps come up with a bespoke session if if it's appropriate, if they want particular input around a, bu a, a book or something like that. We did some uh, some sessions where children were thinking about pirates in a school and we went in and we did uh, we went on a journey as pirates sailing a ship an imaginary journey to an island we explored the island until we found the treasure um and the treasure it, uh, and the 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 pirate went into the classroom to ask for help because he'd lost his first mate he couldn't find his first mate so they went on this journey with a crew of children they learned about it boats and sailing and ships in a very general sense they found a treasure map so we talked about maps and mapping and symbols and we followed uh, we acted out the landscape that we passed through we explored the dangers we solved the problems of climbing over a volcano while well, it was erupting until we found the treasures of the cave in and lo and behold the treasure wasn't actually gold and jewels it was the first mate who'd been hiding in the cave so so that's uh, and so there was kind of the value of things we're talking about different kinds of value for things um yeah and that was a that was a, a, a sort of negotiated session because the, uh, that school wanted something specific for that particular event and what do you think the recipe for success is with maintaining such positive relationships with your partnership schools because as you said earlier you return year after year to many of the same schools within Birmingham surely you are doing something incredibly well to continuously be invited back to these schools year after year is it just the strength of the work or I think that I think that has to be that has to be a significant factor there's much talk about quality and what makes what makes quality and i suppose although <laughs> although we enjoy our work out we take our work seriously uh it's educational purposes and it's it's uh visual aesthetic and it's um you know theatrical standards we we take it seriously uh and we strive to do the best that we can uh, we work with teachers, we build up relationships over a long period of time with teachers and hope that they understand us and they understand how they can get material out of us to what support we are for their learning in the classroom. Um, I think we are fairly unobtrusive, a, a teacher of, a, a, who was supported for many, many years. Uh, basically says they come up, they they do it, they get on with it, they do a good job, and then they leave again. So we we make demands on schools on space and time and things like that, but we understand the school environment and we're fairly pragmatic about what we can expect in terms of quiet and interruptions. You know, it's it's not always good to have a constant stream of people walking through the hall, but in some schools it's inevitable and all you can do is act better to make sure that what you're doing is much more interesting than the people walking through the hall, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. And where do, where do you, at the Playhouse, see the future of theatre and education within five to ten years? Do you think that the model will ultimately have to change due to young people's interactions with technology or do you see that the 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 way in which you present the work now has already stood the test of time long enough for it to continue in its current format well i think it i think it, it can't it can't stay in its current format and it and since its inception in the early 60s or in the 1960s it has continued to evolve and new thoughts and new thinking and there, and there are new trends and Radio Amelia comes to the fore and people understand there's a different kind of thinking around a pedagogy that has to be sort of engaged with, otherwise it becomes a, it becomes a museum piece. So it, it will continue to evolve. Uh, it will 
look at different ways of incorporating technology. We will keep and at someone like CMT, for instance, that they've basically moved from what you would call a traditional theatre and education company when I first knew them to being a sort of a, looking at drama and digital media and looking at how those things can communicate across the globe. And they're looking at how how drama fits with digital media and and the other way around, digital media can enhance enhance drama. So that it will it will continue to evolve. Obviously the 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 sort of pandemic has put extra pressures on everybody in education and in theatre. So there's a new set of challenges to try and meet. Um, we're, we're at the Playhouse are looking at different models of working. So rather than turn up and do a programme and provide teaching resources for teachers to follow and support their learning, we've, we've got some uh, uh, persi- um, a different model where a, a series of visits happens over the course of a half term. So a series of episodes if you like, I'm working with the University of Birmingham in their uh, biomedical science department with biomedical engineers to talk to children about engineering, the role of engineering in medicine, for instance, and to try and raise the profile of women in engineering, uh, to try and raise the profile of a diverse community of engineers to um, to talk about engineering, to, to do design and technology curriculum stuff, to think about forces and different ways in the context of a story, uh, the role of women and the history of engineering, but the children have engineering challenges to overcome and make presentations that then get challenged by a visiting fictional character says, well, this is all well and good, but we can't afford to do that. So then they have to make a case for existing in the real world the the narrative is around a, a female footballer who's broken a leg and needs to recover in time for a big tournament so they're thinking how to fix this one's bones and then if, then of course there's a conversation about is it even worth it for one sports person to spend all this time and effort on one sports person and it's a woman playing football what are they thinking of so there's all sorts of conversations that spiral out of that um, that the teachers can <laughs> contribute to, uh, and we're and we're developing several models. We've uh, we've resurrected, if that's not an unfortunate term, uh, a production about the plague village of Eam in Derbyshire, which you may or may not know about, uh, where the basically the village self isolated to borrow the modern parlance to protect the spread of the plague. We've, we've reworked that. That was a programme that went into schools. We've revisited that story. And the children hear and see diary extracts that have been recorded digitally, so on video, uh, with a performer who's on video. Uh, there's, that's pre-recorded, so they experience that, but then they get to process that live in the classroom um, with a, a teacher actor to try and talk about the situation. And it gives them an opportunity to talk about their experiences and attitudes and opinions about um, about isolation and the summer that's just passed. And I guess prepare them for the winter that we're just about to enter. <laughs> and so it's constantly, constantly changing. And if it, if it ceases to change, then it will, it will um, no longer be of pertinence and will stop of its own accord. We'll all have to retrain, retrain Rishi as a Chancellor of the Exchequer, I fancy. Because <laughs> <laughs> as, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the biggest hurdle is integrating with technology so that, the part- so that the participation doesn't suffer in any way. Yeah. And I think that there's this immediate rush for arts to conform with the integration of technology. And I think that in the case that it makes the work more accessible for as many people as possible, that it is definitely a positive thing that art does move towards integration. However, unfortunately not for it to lose something within its integration. Well, I I think you have to see them as different things. So we've recorded a version of Hansel and Gretel for 
distribution for pe if people want to see that of me doing the version of the story but it's significantly different to how it is in school um although the storytelling is the same the words i say are the same but film is a different form to theater so you just have to acknowledge that and acknowledge the limitations of both and they both both have limitations so the accessibility of getting something out on film particularly when people aren't supposed to be meeting or whatever that's obviously a great advantage you can do that but the downside of that is the spontaneity the the creative moment or the that uniqueness of that particular moment with that particular group of people and that's that's what goes but then you it's a risk benefit thing or a loss benefit thing you kind of go well is it better that they're seeing something or nothing <laughs> so yeah. yeah so what does the more immediate future for the playhouse hold at the moment what are you currently working on and once hopefully social distancing um, and restrictions are eased what direction does the playhouse move into in 2021 Okay, so the Hope program is available to book, and that's that's going on. That's the piece I was talking about about um, about the plague village of Ian and the response to the pandemic. We're revisiting our split second program about knife crime, um, and um, no kidding is a piece that's about bullying and friendship. That's planned for going out after half term, um, which is anti bullying week. Um, but under the under the restrictions that we're on at the moment, we're looking at getting pieces of work out to people who, that we can staff with a single person um, to minimise contact, um, but still provide a level of service. Um, that's that's a, a sort of short term thing. Um, I had a conversation with Juliet the artistic director the other day about possibly doing some sort of Christmas event or maybe some sort of thing that might work for Christmas and a few years ago we did Hans Christian Anders' story of the little match girl which happens on Christmas Eve not a jolly Christmas story um it's um it doesn't have much redemption it's 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 just bleak but it does allow a conversation about charity, Christmas, homelessness, uh, poverty, what our responsibility to other people is. Um, I don't know whether we'll, we'll pursue that. That's a two-person programme at the moment, whether we could rework it or revisit it. Um, yeah, we're thinking about that. <laughs> Great. And all of, all of your work, um, all of your programmes can be found on your website, which I'll include a link to. Um, along yeah. with this podcast as well do you have um, any contact details in case people might want to get in contact with yourself uh, probably the easiest way to get in touch with me is through the website and the contacts um, email there if you substitute info at for malcolm.jennings at uh, the playhouse.org.uk should find its way to me and I, i'm really happy to engage in conversation with people about about their work and the work they're doing uh, i'm not going to write anyone's dissertation for you i always say that um but if you've got specific questions or you just want to run some thoughts by me i'm very happy to do that we we welcome visits to uh come and see our work in schools obviously that's problematic at the moment uh, but um when things improve we're really very happy to have people come and spend time with us observe us if you've got half a day come and see us at work in a school we've got internships that we run from time to time we've currently got someone started um today actually um uh, an intern and we're looking for placements um student placements um from applied theatre courses and it's it's great to actually see that there are applied theatre courses out there that seems a big positive development that it's it's sort of a, a legitimacy to this this form of community theatre in in many different ways about involving people to make art in when i did my degree in the early 1990s <laughs> It was by, with, and for. I suppose that still holds good. Making making art and theatre by 
uh, by people presenting back their stories to them with people for them to tell their own stories and for those people to validate their life experiences and talk about their give them opportunities to talk about their life experiences whatever identifiable demographic or community group they might be or special interest group or whatever identifies them they have in common so uh, yeah give us a shout and uh, keep keep on keeping on <laughs> and thank you so much um for talking to me today malcolm um it's been an absolute thank pleasure you, it's been great to see you again yeah and it's been an absolute pleasure to just sit and take in all of the knowledge that you have and possess and um yeah just thank you very much yeah and all the best to you tom and you're, you're doing a good thing <laughs> Ta-ra.